if you read the sheet, which he's holding there, you know already who I am. Uh, uh, Bob Frischman uh, from Andover. So uh, it's good to be here. I haven't been uh, uh, in this building before. I did a talk some years ago, I think, in the other senior center as well as the Historical Society. And all. So I know that. And as I was telling Kelly, uh, I went to school in the building where the uh, historical, where the uh, senior center usually is. That was my junior high school. So uh, that building is familiar to me. And I guess when I start using the senior center more, I'll be back uh, where I started, right? A big circle got me all the way back to the same building. But uh, what we're seeing now is just my house. This is what, where I live in my uh, workshop, uh, where I do clock stuff, is in the house. It's on 4th Street, just around the corner from the luncheonette there at the Shawshank Square, where uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have had breakfast over the years, too. So we can uh, start moving along, and uh, something that I realize and then forget and realize again is that uh, the cover of my 1969 Andover High School yearbook was a clock face like this. I can't say that that's why I got into clocks, but it's so that every time I'm reminded to look at my yearbook, oh my god, you know, this is all related to clocks. And in case you don't believe me, uh, there's, there's little Bobby Frischman there on, the, uh, on my yearbook page uh, from that yearbook. So I guess I wasn't too inventive in my nickname, you know, I got Bob there, but you can see there are a few other, uh, few other people I kind of remember from those high school years too. But so that that proves that I was there. I know Brian's Oh, there, yeah, yeah. It turned out some of these people are still around, and of course I look the same, but they all look different. So I can't recognize them usually. So uh, you probably noticed that my business name uh, is Bell Time Clocks, and I thought of that uh, many years ago because I just acquired this Winslow Homer engraving uh, that's titled Bell Time. He was an illustrator before he was a fine artist, and uh, he did a lot of work for Harper's Weekly in 1868. He, there was an article about Lawrence, Massachusetts, and he, uh, he knew about Lawrence because his brother was uh, a worker there, higher up, not one of the regular textile workers. So Winslow Homer would go to Lawrence, and uh, he then, uh, there was an article about Lawrence in, in Harper's Weekly, and one of the illustrations was called Bell Time, and it shows the mill workers who were uh, either arriving or uh, leaving uh, the mill for the day's work. There's no clock in this one, but as you see, there is a bell tower in the Atlantic Mill there, which isn't there anymore. And these people already, and it happened even centuries before, were kind of living and breathing by the clock. You know, they, we now we think, oh my God, you know, two minutes late, and you know, we're just sort of totally tuned into what time it is. But that was the case uh, almost during the entire history once clocks were developed. And these people certainly lived, lived and breathed by the clock and by the bell, which the, the clock actuated. If they got to the textile mill and they were a little bit late after the second bell, those gates had closed and they didn't go in, they didn't get a day's pay. So it was, it was a, something very real for them what the time was. But uh, today was a special day for me, and I'm going to digress slightly, uh, because uh, it was, uh, as, as you'll see, something that I, I was up very early this morning dealing with this uh, in a good way. This is the uh, emblem, the logo, of the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers, which is the guild in London, in England, which was founded in 16, chartered in 1631, and uh, by uh, King Charles I, and it was the guild that was established for clockmakers and watchmakers in London so that they could work in the city. And that guild still exists, like more than 100 other London guilds, and they don't necessarily all do that work anymore. Sometimes it's family connections, but I became a freeman of the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers some years ago, and I've gone to some events that you'll see. But I, once you're a freeman for a while, you can be elevated to become a liveryman. And the livery is the robes and all that you put on. So today was a ceremony on Zoom where I didn't become installed as a liveryman yet, but you have to become free of the city in order to be a liveryman. So today was the event uh, in, with, uh, that made me free of the city. So uh, the master of the Clockmakers uh, Guild, the Clockmakers Company this year, is a woman, but they're still called master, Joanna Migdahl. So she was involved in the, uh, in the Zoom program as well, watching as, as a few others of us became, uh, uh, became installed. So 
I'm just seeing if he was arriving, but I'm not sure. So, uh, and this is the clerk of the Chamberlain's Court, and he's the one who's, uh, who's in charge of uh, bringing the, of, of, of granting the free of, free of the city thing, and he's waving the rule book, which talks about how you, uh, you can't be drunk and disorderly and those kinds of things. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Murray Craig, and as he told us, he's just the 37th clerk of the Chamberlain's Court since the 13th century. So uh, I guess these guys hold their jobs a long time, and here he is uh, uh, waving the roll book around, which we'll receive uh, eventually. One of the benefits of being free of the city is that you can drive sheep across London Bridge. And this shows uh, some of them doing that. It used to be any time you wanted to, and it wasn't ceremonials because there was a pretty substantial toll on the bridge back uh, centuries ago. So if you didn't have to pay that toll, it helped you a lot if you were bringing sheep into the city or any livestock to sell. But now, once a year, they do this kind of reenactment, a ceremonial thing, uh, where they drive some sheep across the bridge, and it's a, it's a fun thing. So that's one of the benefits I will have uh, as a freeman. And what I also did uh, is I had to take an oath of allegiance, and I won't read it all there, but in part I was saying that I was going to be obedient to the queen. So uh, whether I violated my American passport, I'm not sure, or my citizenship, uh, but I have now sworn some kind of allegiance to the queen, and I guess uh, that's probably a good thing. I don't think they'll call me up for duty anytime soon. But you can see what the livery looks like. And at the actual installation, which I will hope to go to London to do at some point soon, if they let us go, is you actually are clothed where you put the robes on and you become uh, a, liveryman, uh, a liveryman in that particular guild. So that's going to be exciting. But here's a picture of, this is the past uh, master of the, of the guild, and here I am uh, receiving, uh, uh, being installed as a freeman of the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers. I'm signing the book, which goes back, you know, generations, centuries almost. Uh, so I'm again signing something that probably uh, in, uh, is a problem with my American citizenship, but uh, if you won't tell, I won't either. And of course, there was a lovely luncheon afterwards. This was the Ladies' Day luncheon. Uh, which uh, happened to be uh, the, at the time that my wife and I attended in order for me to become free of the city. And you see some of the members there, and they're always in these unbelievably beautiful guild halls which still exist in the city of London. So uh, uh, I always look around and say, well, what the heck am I doing here? But, uh, <laughs> but it feels good, and it's a lot of fun, and it's interesting. And I guess most important, it lets me meet uh, a lot of my colleagues, you know, that, you know, these two guys here have become good friends. They're both important uh, horologists in London and in England, and they're now friends of mine. So uh, it's not just fun and games, it's, uh, it's professionally very good too. And there's even royalty involved. Uh, you saw the Queen already. Uh, the com Clockmakers Company has an uh, area of the London Science Museum where its wonderful clock collection is, and this is Her Royal Highness Anne, the Queen's sister who was touring the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, museum space when it first opened some years ago. They were in a smaller space, they moved to a bigger space, and uh, Her Royal Highness is, uh, is visiting it. But uh, that's enough about uh, how much fun I'm having uh, pretending I'm, uh, I'm, I'm English, uh, which I'm not. But uh, getting to the meat of the, of the, uh, of the conversation today, uh, we're talking sort of about the history of timekeeping, and uh, I like to start off by asking uh, how many clocks and watches were on the Mayflower, and the answer is zero, because at that point clocks were expensive, unreliable, uh, you couldn't take them on shipboard and expect them to work, and they had other ways of telling the time. This is uh, an illustration of the pilgrims leaving, uh, uh, leaving for America on the ship, and you see no one's got their clock over their shoulder or in their baggage. They did not, uh, they did not have clocks like that. What you may not know is that the, uh, the Mayflower's first stop was not Plymouth, but Provincetown Harbor. And this is a view of it. Uh, uh, my wife and I love to stay in, Providence, uh, in Provincetown sometimes. And that's a view from a little deck that we have uh, uh, in a room we like to stay in. But uh, right out there, kind of in that area, uh, if you were around almost 400 years ago now, is where the Mayflower first anchored, and that's where the Mayflower Compact was signed in Provincetown Harbor. 
One reason that they stopped soon, and actually, as you may know, the Mayflower was headed for Virginia, and they had problems navigating, and we'll talk about those, uh, but they also were running out of provisions. The key provision was beer. And this is showing uh, casks of beer, because the water was undrinkable, but beer was safe to drink because of the alcohol. And they were just about out of beer by the time they had had their perilous long crossing of the Atlantic. And they needed to stop somewhere. And when they stopped there, they were able to find some corn that the Indians had stashed away. And they quickly made some beer, uh, again, not to party, but to, uh, to have something safe that they could drink. And of course, beer was an important beverage throughout American colonial history and even afterwards. This is a great ad talking about Haverhill. And, some, and Mr. Osgood had a brewery in Haverhill. And he's talking about the nice kinds of, uh, of, uh, of beers you could get back there in 1789 in Haverhill. One way that you could measure the passage of time was a sandglass or an hourglass. And that's what we used on shipboard. They would be half hour, and if any of you were in the Navy or, or know about uh, the passage of time on shipboard, there are watches that are half hours long, going from one to eight, and they start over every four hours. So uh, on shipboard would be a half hour sand glass, which would be by the helm. And the helmsman's job, one of them was to turn the glass over when it was empty and announce the next watch with uh, and you see there's still uh, timers like this. So he'd announce the next watch, they'd ring it on the bell, and the next people would come up. This is another Winslow Homer, by the way, of, a, uh, of the sh bell being uh, rung and the sailor calling out what, uh, what watch it was, uh, three bells, five bells, whatever it would be. So uh, the problem was that if the helmsman was out there in the freezing rain or sleet and he was getting tired of trying to steer the ship, he could turn that glass over before the half hour was done. And maybe nobody would notice. It was a thing called eating sand. And if they did that often enough, they could actually reverse day and night on the ship time-wise because they'd been sneaking and eating up uh, a little bit of time along the way. There were mechanical clocks. You know, I said there were none in the Mayflower, but certainly back in Europe, there were big clocks that were in towers beginning in the 13th century. And I show this picture because this is Salisbury Cathedral, which was the home of one of the first known uh, mechanical clocks uh, that we know of. It's no longer up in the tower. There's a different, better, newer one. But this is the clock, and it's a big iron contraption uh, made probably by a blacksmith. But that's what they looked like uh, back then when they had that. And it was, nobody had these in their houses. They were public towers. Uh, in order for the public to know the time. And of course, there are famous towers still everywhere with clocks in them, including, of course, what we see here, the Tower at Westminster, or what we call as Big Ben. This is an old photograph of the first day, kind of the uh, inauguration of Big Ben. The key thing to keep in mind, especially if you want to annoy people with trivia, is that Big Ben is not the name of the tower or the clock. It's the name of the bell. And eventually, the whole thing became called Big Ben. But originally, it's still technically accurate. Uh, the bell is Big Ben, and the rest of it is called something else. So uh, this is another example, one of my horology and art examples. I love it. It's by Titian. Some of you may know that name of a Renaissance artist. And uh, he did portraits of important people. This is the uh, Duchess of Urbino. The Duke had been exiled. He got into some political trouble. So the Duchess was running the place. And you can see uh, the, her lands in the background. And again, this is not a selfie, a quick, por a quick picture from a phone. This is a formal portrait where the, the sitter and the artist decided what was going to be in the picture. And one of the things they decided to put in the picture, in addition to her lovely uh, dress and her watchful spaniel, was a clock. And the clocks, which appear in these early paintings, are always there for a reason. They're metaphors for not only the transience of life, but also the fact that she was affluent and sophisticated and modern, because clocks were new at that point. Very few people had them. They were expensive. So if the Duchess of Urbino had one of these little clocks, it right away told people that this was an important person who was disciplined and modern. There's a close-up of that type of clock that were made in northern Italy, southern Germany, probably in Nuremberg in this case. And if you look closely, you see it only has one hand. And clocks only had one hand uh, until some hundreds of years later. If you think about it, you don't need two hands. You can tell that it's around 1 o'clock now. And if the hand is halfway between 1 and 2, it would be 1.30. So uh, you can tell old clocks 
uh, for the, one way of sell, telling them is if they're uh, if they're one-handed. This is a view of an early uh, clock-making shop. Uh, often the clockmakers were among the most sophisticated, experienced, trained, smart uh, people in in the tr in the trades because it was very diff difficult work. You had a lot of math involved in figuring out uh, if the if the gears are turning, how to make sure that it converts into the hours being shown correctly. So these were sophisticated. You can see some clocks being made here, some some bigger clocks. So. Uh, and this is a view from uh, again several centuries ago of a clockmaker's uh, clockmaker's workshop. The uh, there were many other depictions of watches and clocks during the golden age of uh, of Dutch art in Holland. Uh, there were a lot of these vanitas pictures that had imagery that again spoke to people right away about um, spiritual issues, the passage of time, life's pleasures, but also the fact that time is speeding by. So there's often these watches in here, and of course watch collectors and lovers like me love this because these Dutch artists were very used very fine brushes and created great detail. So you actually can see quite a bit uh, of the watches uh, from these from these early 17th century paintings. And in this case, we know that this watch also um, was a repeater, meaning it could it could ring the hours because this was a bell inside the lid and the lid is perforated, so he could push a little button, and if it were dark or he didn't want to have to pull out his watch, he'd hear a little ding, 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 and it would tell him what the, what the hour was. So there were often portraits, too. You see this is probably, possibly a bridal portrait, and she's holding a watch, and perhaps a gift uh, from, from the groom, but also, again, to show that she was affluent and sophisticated. There's a close-up of the watch, and again, you can see that it's a single-hand watch that she's got in her hand, too. And here's a, a real example of one of those, and with one hand. Uh, but you'll notice here too is that within the lid is a sundial, because up until a hundred and some years ago, the way virtually everybody set their mechanical wind-up clocks and watches was with the sundial. There was no other way. There was no GPS, no radio, nobody uh, telling you what time it was, especially the town clocks and all. The way you did it was by using a sundial. So obviously it had to be sunny out and it had to be daytime, not nighttime. But if you had the sundial and it was oriented correctly, you'd know the time and then you could set your other clock or watch. The sundials are still in use. This one's in the lovely garden at Beauport in Gloucester. Some of you at they visited that historic New England site. So they're going to sundial, and if you look, you know, the gnomon is the pointer, and it's pointing at the hour. So you've got a pretty good idea of what time it is from your sundial. And of course, we have a big one right up here uh, on the grounds of Phillips Academy. This is the Paul Manship uh, armillary sphere, which is sort of just a big elaborate sundial, and uh, that also tells the time. Uh, they're more decorative now, of course, too, but they're useful. And sundials go back to ancient Egypt, really, but uh, certainly they were around in Roman and Greek times. And this is actually a mosaic from ancient Greece showing a sundial on top of a pedestal. And the translation, roughly, of this uh, wording up here is, I'm late for lunch. Already, <laughs> these people were, as I was talking about before, were getting all you know torn up about the fact that this timepiece was ruling their lives now. That they used to eat when they were hungry, go to bed when they were sleepy. Now this darn thing is telling them, oh, you can't eat until the shadow comes over to one or whatever it was. So already they were complaining about the tyranny of it. So uh, another one of our American stories, of course, is Pocahontas. And we see an illustration here of her saving Captain John Smith. The issue is that the, uh, the story's not quite true because what really saved his life first before Pocahontas arrived is the sundial, the little pocket sundial that uh, Captain John Smith had with him. Uh, and this is an example similar to what he would have had, and that was how he was telling time. And the Indians supposedly were so uh, intrigued by this instrument that he was showing them how it worked and everything, and that's what stopped them from beating him to death uh, until Pocahontas showed up and gave them more reasons to not uh, not kill him on the spot. So uh, just remember that too when you hear the stories of Pocahontas. Another important one, this is uh, Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island after he got booted out of Boston for not being uh, religious enough according to their strictures. So he's arriving in Rhode Island, he's uh, peacefully meeting the, the Native Americans who are welcoming him there, and we still have Roger Williams 
pocket sundial. This is in a collection, and we know of it. And this is, again, how he was telling time uh, uh, when he was uh, long ago in our neighboring state and actually in our own state, too. Uh, you probably recognize this fellow uh, as Ben Franklin. And I have him here, not only because he actually designed and invented an unusual clock, uh, but it was so unusual that no one ever used it. Uh, but more importantly, he was the designer of our first American colonial currency as we had declared independence. So this is 1776. And Ben Franklin, as you know, was very interested through Poor Richard's Almanac and all that, of making sure that everybody was working hard to build this great country to really apply yourself. And that's what mind your business means. It doesn't mean mind your own business, don't be nosy. It means get to work, let's build this country and stay busy. And one of the symbols of being busy was a sundial and the sun shining on it. So even in our first American currency, there was a sundial involved in that. And for all you gardeners, uh, if you want to create a floral clock, uh, it was figured out centuries ago that these flowers would open at specific times during the day. And you could tell what time it was by when that particular flower opened. So this is tricky because they don't all grow in the same climate. But if you can uh, put these together, you'll end up uh, with a floral clock that will also help you uh, know what time it is. Uh, this is not me. This is Galileo. And he's important to the story, too. Because up until around the, uh, the uh, late 1600s, uh, clocks like the one you saw at the Salisbury Cathedral were not very accurate. They had something called folios that would click back and forth. And if you got accurate to within 15 minutes a day, you were lucky. And even an hour a day was, was, was challenging for these early clocks. But he had the idea, while he was sitting in the cathedral in Pisa, and you can see we're at Pisa here, because there's the uh, Prince Spaghetti Tower that we all know about. Uh, but there's the cathedral. So he was sitting inside this cathedral, and he saw a lantern swinging back and forth. And he realized that no matter how wide the swing of the lantern was on its rope or chain, it went back and forth at the same rate. And he was timing it with his pulse, because he had a, you know, his pulse was pretty constant. So he could tell that even if it was a big swing or a little swing, it went back and forth at the same rate. And he said, I wonder if we could apply this law of physics of gravity, essentially, to clock, keep, to clock making. So he sketched it. He had the idea. He never produced it. There's a clock that's been made based on his design. But it really sparked the concept of applying a pendulum to a clock, which increased the accuracy a hundredfold. And the fellow that did it is Christian Huygens. Uh, again, in the late 1700s, who actually commissioned a Dutch clockmaker to make a clock with a pendulum and uh, kind of revolutionary, revolutionized timekeeping, which allowed a lot of other things because we suddenly could do accurate timekeeping. And astronomers uh, and scientists were so happy about Huygens that there actually is a satellite up in space named the Huygens satellite based on him. And, uh, and I didn't take that picture, but uh, yeah, trust me, it's up there and it's called Huygens. This probably does look familiar to you because now, increasingly, not only in Europe but America, there were towers and there were clocks in those towers. And it was a sign of the community's sophistication and affluence, just like the Duchess of Urbino personally, that if a town sort of had it together enough, had enough people, had enough uh, local wealth, the economy was strong, they could not only build a tower, but they could buy a clock to put in the tower. So here we see. Uh, of course, South Church, it's got a tower up there. So even if you couldn't see the hands, of course, you could hear the bell from miles off, too. So it became the standard time. And again, that time was set by a sundial. So if the, if the time wandered a little bit, they could reset it. Uh, inside South Church, if some of you uh, uh, belong there or have been in there, is a lovely uh, uh, gallery clock, these are called. Uh, and uh, actually, I've serviced this clock. I'm happy to do it as a donation for them. But that's inside, made by a very important early uh, Boston clockmaker. And that's what it looks like inside, along with a lot of repairers' notes who had uh, written in there as they worked on the clock. But that's the simple movement that's hanging inside, driven by weight, as most of these early clocks were, not a spring. Springs were hard to make and expensive. 
So there you see them. But there was even uh, earlier meeting houses. This isn't. This is Andover too. But of course, that building isn't there anymore. But there were other places with towers with uh, clocks in them uh, all around the area too. And it again showed that we were uh, a burgeoning community. This one, of course, is on the Phillips Academy. There's Samuel Phillips Hall, lovely blue dial clock in there. This is right down where I live. Uh, my house is back in there. Unfortunately, you can't see it in this old postcard, but there is a clock up in that tower, too, with a bell. I guess I consider myself lucky that that clock hasn't run for years, because that bell would probably be keeping me up at night. I have been up in that tower, and whatever, the original movement is long gone, and somebody tried putting some electric thing in there that obviously didn't work well, so that clock hasn't worked. Uh, ever since I've lived there. And of course, just over the river in Lawrence is the Air Mill Clock Tower. And you can see this was uh, at one time the largest mill clock in the world. You can see the workers uh, in the dial before they finished installing the clock. There's the movement inside. Uh, but it's only six inches smaller in diameter than Big Ben and our clock in London. So it's a huge clock. And perhaps now when you drive by there, you'll have even more of an appreciation for it. This is the church over in, uh, in North Andover Center, the old center there. Uh, so they have a clock in there. And they do have an old movement in that, uh, in that tower. Uh, it's made by the E. Howard Company in Boston that made beautiful clock towers and other types of clocks as well. So, uh, so that's sitting up in the tower. And I've been fortunate enough to look up in, inside there. The other great thing about that is the bell that's still in there, the original bell, that name might look familiar to you. Paul Revere not only rode his horse around New England screaming, but uh, uh, one of the other things he did was a, uh, a bell founding company that he and his son produced later in his life. And there are hundreds of Paul Revere bells uh, still in towers throughout New England. But it was great to see this one actually there. And we'll talk about Paul Revere a little bit more later. But here's a scene of downtown Boston uh, in the 18th century. And uh, there was a, a public clock that was up uh, in, the, in the State House Square there that showed that. But in that same location, uh, a momentous event happened that you may recognize this too. It's the Boston Massacre in 1770. Uh, Paul Revere uh, engraved this view of it. And it was a propagandistic view of it. Uh, uh, Boston Massacre did not happen like this, but uh, we were already getting kind of angry with the British and didn't like the fact that their soldiers had occupied Boston uh, and we wanted to get rid of them. So uh, this was kind of a, uh, uh, an altered version of what happened. But Paul Revere was in such a hurry to get this, out, so this print out so he could not only make some money selling it but spread the word, uh, was that in the clock there in the, in the building, uh, he got the time wrong by two hours. Uh, and he realized that after he'd already uh, run off a lot of prints, so there's two editions of this print, and the second one on the copper plate he corrected the time. So we uh, see it there. But this is actually a twofer as well, because not only is the clock there, but there's a large public sundial on the face of this building. Uh, so uh, sort of amplifying the point that uh, you couldn't always trust or be sure of the mechanical clock, but as long as the sun was out, you'd know exactly what time it was from a sundial, whether it was on a, a little pedestal in your garden or on a big one on the face of a building somewhere. And uh, uh, American Revolution is very important to me now because one of the things I do is I run annual conferences. I mentioned the Horology and Art one at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, next year, uh, I'm running one down in Philadelphia, and it's all about timekeeping clocks and watches during the American Revolution. So if some of you want to uh, uh, join us down in Philadelphia next October, it was supposed to be tomorrow, uh, but we put it off a year, uh, uh, please uh, feel free to, to join us. It will be at the New American uh, Revolution Museum, which is a wonderful new museum right in downtown historic Philadelphia. There were clocks made in Boston already in the in the, in the 1700s for rich people. This is an example by Galen Brown, who also made public clocks uh, in a Japan case. It looks Asian. It's not. They just people were interested in Chinese and Japanese decorative arts at that point. So they would decorate furniture with, uh, with Asian looking uh, motifs. But, uh, so they had tall case clocks at that time too. But you notice I'm saying tall case clock because no one then and up until 1876, when this song became popular, called them grandfather clocks. 
you went back to uh, somebody in 1800 and asked for a grandfather clock, they would have no idea what you were talking about. They were called tall clocks, eight-day clocks, because they ran a week, that kind of thing. But this song, which some of you may be humming in your head right now, uh, is, uh, uh, was, became popular, and after a while, everyone started to call them grandfather clocks instead. One of the uh, places where the first American important grandfather clocks were produced was at the Willard House in Grafton. The Willard family was an important clock-making family. They eventually moved to Boston. But this is now a museum out near Worcester, which is a wonderful place to go. There's more than 50 uh, uh, beautiful Willard clocks on display there. He then moved to, uh, to Roxbury, uh, adjacent to Boston, when Boston was much smaller and just connected by a little neck to, uh, to Roxbury and the rest of, uh, the rest of Boston. But uh, of course, Roxbury doesn't look like this now. But at the time, there was a community there of furniture makers and clock makers, and they all worked together uh, to build furniture and clocks, and, uh, and all belonged to the same church. So they were a, a real community there. So this is an older view of Roxbury for that reason. This is Simon Willard, one of the brothers. He was the most inventive, not the best businessman, but the most uh, inventive uh, and designed uh, clocks. This is an example of a tall clock, a grandfather clock by Simon Willard. They're called Roxbury cases for that reason. So they have distinctive features like this nice fretwork, kind of the beautiful narrow, uh, narrow waist, uh, etc. And these are quite uh, desirable and, uh, and collectible. And of course, we have some grandfather clocks even here in Andover. I did an article some years ago about uh, clocks in Andover, and this is one of them that's at the Historical Society uh, that I was able to feature. Dr. Charles Courier, did any one of you know him? Uh, he lived on Central Street, one of the big houses. He was around when I first came here, but I sadly never got to meet him. But he was a major clock collector, and this is one of these clocks that ended up at the Andover Historical Society afterwards. One of the others that you saw in the previous picture, it's by uh, uh, Nathan Adams, who was in the Andover briefly. So it's great to see his name on a clock dial. And uh, I happened to see this was coming up at an auction, and I alerted this, uh, the Historical Society, and they got some money together and bought the clock. And I said, this is great, because you're never going to see another one. And of course, like six months later, another Andover <laughs> clock came up at auction. And they had to buy that one, too. And I don't know whether they're happy or sad, because they, they spent a lot of money. But now I almost can absolutely say they're never going to see another Andover clock, because I don't think they were that many. But there's uh, uh, there. And he was only here a, a few years around that time. He was in Danvers, and he moved up to Maine. So it's really kind of important that they have that clock. And there's the other clock that they have by John Osgood in Andover. Of course, Osgood is a, is a good Andover name, so that's fun to see it there, too. There was another Andover maker, Daniel Burnap, but don't be fooled, that's Andover, Connecticut. So if you see one of these and get all excited, you're getting a local clock, you'd have to move to Connecticut in order for it to be local. Uh, for you. And I'm showing the, this uh, main building of the Centennial Exhibition, the 100th anniversary of our nation that was held in Philadelphia in 1876, because there was a connection there. I came across this one reference in a book saying that at the Centennial was said to be the first clock brought to Andover, Massachusetts. And I've never been able to find anything else about this clock. So it's kind of frustrating, but it was there. There was a building at the Centennial called the, uh, uh, you know, an early American uh, household, and there was a colonial kitchen within it that was staffed by people in colonial garb. And this is the only illustration that shows what they're saying, and that other source was the first clock that was brought to Andover, Massachusetts. So from what we can see here, it's sort of a primitive clock called the lantern clock, and there's an example of one from uh, uh, that, would, that was in another early, uh, early New England home at around the same time. Of course, you needed to have that, too, in case somebody was firing arrows at you, I guess. Uh, but uh, on the wall, you might have uh, what's again called a lantern clock, because it sort of looks like a lantern. These were designed in England. The pendulum and the weights would all hang below and, and swing in the air. So I'm pretty sure that's what that Andover clock was. but. So far, I've reached a dead end uh, in getting there. So here's a, you know, another closer look at a Simon Willard clock. And there's been a big controversy about how much the Willards actually made, because they could import uh, clock movements, clock faces, clock parts from England. I don't think they brought any cases over. 
but it's increasingly obvious that they probably mostly, even though they were clockmakers, that they assembled clocks and sold imported things from England. For example, in this case, here's the Simon Willard dial. Here's the back of it. And you see it says Wilson on the, on the piece of the dial that's back there. <coughs> Wilson was a Birmingham, England dial maker. So for sure, this dial came from England, all painted up like this, and simply Simon Willard's name got applied to it later. Another one of my horology and art images, uh, and I love these generic, uh, these genre scenes of New England households, because you see again, if they're trying to say this is a sophisticated, fairly affluent family or well-to-do family, they would have a tall clock in the room. And in this painting of their room, you see it there. So this is called a frolic which was another name for a party, essentially, but it was chaperone where young people could, could flirt and you know, perhaps arrange a future liaisons, but the whole family was there keeping an eye on it. So it's, it's a great view of all kinds of stuff that's happening in an early New England interior, and it could hand over, probably have similar looking spaces, but there's the tall clock there. And this is from uh, um, just down the road, uh, let's see, in Bolton, Massachusetts, this is uh, an artist called Robert Peckham. This painting is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. The Peckham house is still there. And this is the Peckham family. So the artist painted his family, again, affluent enough to have a, a tall clock in the corner. And, but you kind of wonder, you know, this looks like a party, but things look kind of somber. And it's because this is what's called a posthumous painting. Because this little girl, little Elizabeth, had died about three months before this painting was made. But it was a tradition then um, to create family paintings in which the dead person was depicted as being still with the family. So it's kind of a sad thing in a way when there are many examples of posthumous paintings. But in this case, we know the story and we know that little Elizabeth was no longer there in body, but clearly there in spirit. So in fact, again, at Andover Historical Society or whatever the center for whatever it is now, I, I've forgotten. They have this lovely little miniature painting by Clarissa Peters uh, uh, showing uh, the reason I glommed on it right away is because the little kid is holding a watch. But this also could be a posthumous painting. We can't be sure. But often, if the mother is wearing black, uh, it indicates mourning, and it could be within that, uh, that genre of a posthumous painting where that child actually was deceased. As you know, Half the kids didn't make it to their fifth birthdays back then. So it's a pretty good guess that that's a posthumous painting as well. There were certainly other of uh, these folk art paintings. This is by an artist named Joseph Davis who went town to town and would stay with people and do their portraits in exchange for room and board, and maybe a few coppers uh, to, to help, them, help them along. So there's a lot of these, and some of them have banjo clocks or other clocks within the scene. Whether this family had a banjo clock, it's possibly unlikely even. But you know, who cares? You can, like the Duchess of Urbino, this is your portrait. You can put in it what you want, even if you didn't have it. So they probably had a little kitty. Uh, those weren't expensive, and you needed them for the mice. Uh, but whether they had a banjo clock, uh, we're not sure. So banjo clocks often had these, well, always had these painted tablets in the bottom. A lot of them had historic scenes. This shows the famous 1812 battle of the Constitution and the, and the Guerriere. So we were, uh, an important thing that happened in Connecticut was the Industrial Revolution in America. Uh, England was already doing textiles, but we began figuring out ways to mass produce things in ways that the world had not done before. And this is Eli Terry, and he's important. Here's his uh, water wheel, which powered his factory, which was the first to make interchangeable parts, and they were made for clock movements. There's arguments with the gun people because they say the armories were making interchangeable parts for pistols and muskets and all, but they weren't. They still had to be fitted afterwards to work properly. But with with American clocks, uh, this is a pillar and scroll style style clock. They actually mass produced the parts, and they could be interchangeable. They could go into those movements without a lot of alteration. And you can see here's an example. Seth Thomas is one of the big names in early American clock making. And brass was expensive. The English didn't want us to have or make brass. What we had plenty of was wood. So we actually began making these clock movements out of wood. 
and they worked. They weren't great to export over the Atlantic. The humidity would kill them, but there were millions, well, hundreds of thousands of these made and sold throughout America in the early 1800s, and all with these wood movements inside. And I did a little article because the Andover Historical Society has a pillar and scroll clock, and I was making the point that, um, you know, we all look at, oh boy, this antique clock, isn't this wonderful? You know, and those people who owned it, you know, they had this wonderful antique. You know, when they bought it, it wasn't an antique. It was an appliance. It was perhaps the first one. They didn't have a washing machine or a dishwasher or a microwave. But perhaps the first machine they had, the first appliance they had, was a clock. And that's what they considered it. And it was a useful, functional part of the household family. So that's the point I was making with that article. And these clocks were sold by peddlers. They were uh, guys in wagons. You see a clock there in the back. Would go farm to farm, town to town, selling these clocks. And often they would leave it uh, at the farm with the housewife. Uh, and say, well, you know, don't pay me now, just see if you like it, and I'll come back in a few months, and if you don't want it, I'll take it back. And it was probably 99.9% .9 that that farm wife, housewife, was not giving that clock up, no matter whether her cheapskate husband wanted it or not. She was going to have a nice clock on the mantle to, uh, to impress her friends and keep track of the time. So it was a good sales, a uh, good marketing tool at the time. Later in the 1800s, the 1840s, we had a very serious depression. Most of the uh, woodworks, clock businesses went out of business, uh, but a guy named Chauncey Jerome figured out a way finally to make an inexpensive brass clock in Connecticut. And the way you knew it was a brass clock, they always left a big hole in the middle, so you could see that it was brass behind there, not wood. Uh, as eventually we began to make spring-driven clocks. This is Elias Ingram. He looks prosperous because he was. He was a major clock maker, and he invented the steeple clock, although again, if you went back and asked for a steeple clock, no one would know what you were talking about. It was called a sharp gothic clock, and spring-driven. It no longer had to have big weights hanging down, and what do you do with them? Do you need a big case uh, to contain them? All you had was a little coiled-up spring, like in the clocks that we see on the table here and that would power the clock instead of a weight hanging down. So there's an, another example of a lovely, now we call them steeple clock, that were made in big numbers, very popular, and they were relatively inexpensive. You didn't have to be the Duchess of Urbino anymore to have a clock. You could be a farmer or a, a, a merchant or even a, a, a worker in the city and have a clock like this. This is one of my favorite horology and art things. This is also at the Museum of Fine Arts. Because you see there's a steeple clock there, but clearly this artist had a lot of trouble with perspective and uh, proportions in paintings. Because either that kid was huge or, uh, or, or the clock was tiny, uh, and I don't think either was the case. They just kind of uh, got a little mixed up on, the, on painting these things. Uh, later, in the, uh, the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, these types of clocks became very popular, black mantle clocks they were called. They were imitating more expensive French clocks, actually made out of marble and stone that looked like this, but they were extremely popular, and we're, now we're talking maybe some of your grandparents, parents even had clocks that looked like this, or maybe there's one down in the cellar, they were made by the millions, but they were important to families. And I show this picture because there was a, in 1914 there was a great fire in Salem, Massachusetts, and this is a picture showing uh, the mother and two of her kids fleeing, essentially, and they grabbed a few of the things that they valued, and one of them is one of these black mantle clocks under her arm. Uh, I'm assuming she only had two kids, you know, and she didn't leave, that, leave one of them behind and took the clock instead. Uh, but here she is fleeing. And in case you want to see what Salem looked like in 1914, uh, that was the city after that fire. So. Uh, uh, you probably know that fires were serious issues, and as we're seeing now in California, of course. But in cities, you know, a lot of cities, uh, big parts of them, or the whole place, uh, burnt down, and that happened in Salem uh, as well as uh, other places too. I'm not sure if there was ever a big fire in Andover. Certainly, plenty of places burnt down, but I'm not sure it was a conflagration such as we saw there. So another part of my horology and art collection are old photographs. Uh, Matthew Brady, you might recognize that name. He was a famous Civil War era photographer, and he took pictures of famous people. And in his studio, he had a clock, and you could, uh, if you wanted, you could have that clock in the picture with you, just like the Duchess of Urbino showing a clock, showing that you were smart and rich, and you thought maybe you looked better if you had a clock next to you. 
You may recognize this fellow, that's uh, George Custer. He, uh, he liked himself a lot and he had several portraits made by Matthew Brady of him in the studio. Uh, he, as you know, his life story didn't end well, but we have that. And there's an image of that clock. It was called the Reaper model and it appeared in a later catalog as well. So, uh, and here's another person you might, we only recognize, we only got half the clock in there, but Robert E. Lee also decided to have his picture taken with that same clock in the Brady studio. This is my favorite, even though she's not as famous, uh, she decided too to not only have the big Bible that other people had in their pictures at Brady studio, but she had the clock. This is Dr. Mary Walker. She was the first recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor to a woman. You see it pinned there. She was given to it by Abraham Lincoln for her service during the war. But she became much more famous afterwards because not only was she an advocate for women's suffrage, but she was an even stronger advocate of women's dress reform. So this might not look that unusual to you now, but to people at the time, she was dressed almost obscenely. You know, she, uh, she wore no corset, she didn't have a lot more clothing. You can see her legs, she often wore trousers. They often accused her of being a man. Uh, and she faced a lot of ridicule, but she, as a physician particularly, knew the damage that corsets and other types of women apparel, uh, how dangerous they were to women's health, including Longfellow's wife, whose big dress caught on fire and killed her uh, right in front of him in her house in Cambridge. So, you know, there were a lot of problems with women's attire at the time, and Dr. Mary Walker was uh, a foremost advocate for dealing with, uh, with those problems. Another issue where timekeeping was very important was in navigation. And uh, there were a lot of shipwrecks because ships didn't know once they lost sight of land where they were. Uh, Admiral Cloudsley Shovel, some of you may have read the book Longitude that I'll show in a minute, but he uh, leads the story because the British, as a major maritime power, didn't like losing a lot of ships and sailors and soldiers. And uh, it really came to a head in 1707 when, when Admiral Shovel was uh, returning from uh, duty uh, with a large fleet in the Mediterranean. He was approaching the southern tip of England, and he was near the Scilly Islands, S-C, Scilly Islands. And one of his officers said, hey, uh, Admiral, I think we're close to the Scilly Islands, like dangerously close. That officer was immediately hanged for questioning the navigational abilities of the Admiral. And sure enough, within a few minutes, they hit the rocks. Uh, several ships were crushed, lost, 1,200 sailors drowned. Admiral Shovel survived, crawled up on the beach of the island, and was clubbed to death by a woman who was stealing his watch. So it's a, maybe a fitting end, but the British decided, you know, we got to deal with this. And one way of knowing where you are on the ocean is if you know very accurately what time it is. Uh, they could know the your latitude, your north-south position, pretty easily using sextants like you see here and in this Winslow Homer painting, another one called Eight Bells, which is a very famous painting that's at the Addison Gallery. Uh, if you use a sextant, you can tell your position north-south, but east-west longitude was much more difficult, so a sextant, like you see our little man here too, would not do you any good uh, for that. But in this wonderful book by David Sobel that became quite a bestseller, it talks about the English clockmaker who over some decades worked hard to create a marine clock that would be accurate enough and it had to be accurate within seconds a month or it was useless. But he, and everyone said it's impossible, even Isaac Newton said you'll never make a watch that accurate, but he stuck to it here. He showed, showing what eventually he won the longitude prize, which the uh, British Parliament had offered to try to solve this problem. It was an immense amount of money but he had to fight hard to get it after he'd proven that he could do it. And then eventually the winner ended up being a small, almost pocket watch size thing. There, it's H4, Harrison Ford, his fourth attempt. Uh, this is in Greenwich, England. You can see it, it's still there, uh, along with H1, 2, and 3 as well, his other attempts to make something accurate enough. And that really revolutionized uh, navigation because then you could fairly easily know where you were east-west as well as north-south, and your ship wouldn't end up either on the rocks or in Provincetown instead of Virginia, which is a, a problem I mentioned earlier. Eventually his technology, Harrison's technology, was used to 
create in large numbers what are called marine chronometers, these small clocks, which are extremely accurate. The nice thing about this one is that it was made by William Bond right in Boston. Mostly they were made in England, but William Bond was a famous maker here. Here's a picture of his store on Congress Street. You can see William Bond and Sons chronometers. Uh, chronometers mentioned there too, so that was uh, uh, one of the things they did. It's a port, so a lot of the captains brought their chronometers there for repair and setting and adjustment. This is another chronometer that looks like it's had a rough life. This was made in Liverpool, which is where a lot of them were made. But the reason this looks so rough, it was on a ship that some of us might recognize. Uh, as you know, they found the wreck of the Titanic, and they recovered some things from the wreck, including that chronometer, which I don't think they intend to run again, but uh, they have it as an artifact. So a lot of boats were not out of sight of land, and they didn't need chronometers like this uh, lovely one that was running uh, up and down the coast here. But once you got out of sight of land, you needed to know somehow where you were, and again, you didn't have GPS or radio or anything, so you needed something to find you there. The other place you needed accurate timekeeping was in the railroads. We started to build railroad lines here in the early 1800s. Thoreau heard the train going by uh, Walden Pond. And a lot of the issues with railroads is that they were on single track lines. And if you didn't get off to the side when the other train was coming the other way, you ended up with a lot of expensive scrap metal. And that's what happened in this case. This is the earliest known photograph of a train wreck. And it's just because the, uh, one engineer was said, get on the siding at 8.15 because the train's coming the other way. And his watch said it was 8.10. And, it really, and the other guys watched that it was 8.15, this is what happened. And the government and the train railroad companies got sick of this, and they enforced more accurate timekeeping as well. It wasn't so big an issue when you can see here Boston, uh, Fall River, you know, it was a couple of trains a day, it didn't matter. But once the schedules got busier, it definitely mattered, and there were a lot of train wrecks. And even around here, you know, this is a trolley, there's the Musgrove building in Andover, and you know, I don't think those trolleys were going to run into each other and kill people. But uh, you know, already, you know, if that trolley was supposed to leave at 7:15, so you'd get to work at 7:30 or 8:15, um, you wanted these things to run accurately, and you needed accurate clocks and watches to do it. And the answer really was what were called railroad watches. And it wasn't just because they had a picture of a train on the watch; they were much more expensive, much more refined pocket watches that, again, could keep accurate time within seconds a month. And, uh, and that's really what revolutionized timekeeping. And many of these were made right down the road in Waltham. This is the Waltham factory, an early version of it. The building is still there, bigger, but not a watch factory anymore. But they do have a great little museum there that tells the story as well. So they began mass producing uh, watches. Before that, uh, we were making them hardly at all. They were coming from England, from France, from Switzerland. Oddly enough, the watches from Switzerland were junk. Nobody wanted them. Every two out of three didn't work when they got here. The watchmakers hated them because they couldn't fix them. So there was a ready market for more reliable American-made watches if we could do it. And the way we did it was building them by machine, the same way Eli Terry did. He created machines that could mass produce the parts instead of a watchmaker having to make individual parts by hand. And that's what Waltham did. And what really gave them the spark was the Civil War. Uh, they were limping along, and it wasn't that big a market, but suddenly all these soldiers wanted to watch. And because a lot of the battles and movements during the Civil War were timed, it was more and more important for officers and even regular uh, enlisted men to have watches with them. And there's, uh, uh, again, an early portrait of a Civil War soldier holding his soldier's watch, which uh, almost certainly was one of these early Walthams. There's a, a picture of it. Uh, and that's the type of watch that was made uh, during the Civil War that these soldiers uh, would carry. There's some great um, stereo view pictures from uh, more than 100 years ago, other pictures from inside the watch factory. So you see the big windows there. You see people at work. And the other thing about it, there's another uh, room within the factory. Of course, they've got a nice clock on the wall there. But you see that almost all the workers in this room were women. And Waltham was one of the first factories and companies to not only employ large percentages of women, but to pay them the same amount if they were doing the same work as the men. So uh, they were advanced at that time. And of course, women you know, had the dexterity, the eyesight, 
Uh, so they were perfect for doing a lot of the uh, close work within watch factories. So you see a lot of them are there. And, you know, they were uh, happy to work there. It was well lit. It was warm. had to be clean because you can't make watches in a dirty, dusty factory. So it was pleasant, well-paid work at the time. Of course, there were local watchmakers, too. You see, uh, there's an ad from uh, the 1800s of a guy right on Main Street, Mr. Whiting, established in 1867. Because these watches, even though they were good and reliable and accurate, it was dusty out there and cold and hot and, and wet. And these watches needed service frequently. Usually every year, every couple of years, you needed a watchmaker to clean your watch. And that's why every town, even Andover, would have two, three, four watchmakers who were kept busy year round from people uh, having to service their watches. It's because we got more and more used to having them. If it didn't work, uh, we, we, uh, we weren't happy. So down the street of Andover, again, this is another old uh, stereo view image of Main Street in Andover, uh, probably one of these shops, uh, I can't tell without a magnifier, maybe even then that, but uh, no doubt one of those shops was a watchmaker even that long ago. And there's, again, a very early photograph of what a watchmaker you know, wanted to look like, having his portrait taken there with his, uh, with his, uh, with his work in front of him. These types of photographs are quite desirable. These antique photographs are called occupationals, showing workers with their tools uh, doing their work. So that's a good one. And of course, uh, Norman Rockwell, uh, who memorialized so many of these uh, lovely scenes of American history, uh, one of his famous ones too is the, is the old watchmaker and the little boy who's intrigued watching him work. Uh, you know, I think people always, even when I started doing this, uh, uh, when I had hair and it was brown, you know, people were kind of surprised that I wasn't, you know, an old guy like that. I thought like every watchmaker had to be old and all hunched over and all. So I'm working on it, but uh, so far, uh, so far, I'm trying to keep my youthful uh, demeanor as much as I can. So we're almost done here. But one nice thing that I also found at the Andover Historical Society was this watch paper, because often when you have uh, pocket watches. Inside is a little disc of paper with the name of the last guy who worked on it, or sometimes there'd be a sandwich of them with all these papers just piled up in the back showing uh, that uh, who, who the watchmaker was who worked on it last or maybe who sold it initially. So it's great that they actually have Seth Shearman. I have, uh, uh, I think, an ad also by Seth Shearman. Again, he was uh, uh, the earlier 1800s in Andover. And he had these, uh, these watch papers printed up, and he would put them in the backs of watches, uh, just like all the other ones did, too. So it was wonderful to see that. So we're about at the end. Uh, the reason I show this horology and art image, this is a great one by Jerome Thompson. And this is from the top of Mount Mansfield, the highest mountain in Vermont. And you can't quite see it, but if you look there, I'll show you uh, an enlargement because you see this fellow in the, in the climbing group is holding his watch up because you see it's starting to get a little dusky out there. He's saying, oh, oh, you know, it's getting late. If we don't want to be falling down this mountain in the dark, maybe, maybe we better get going. So that's kind of my cue for saying I've reached the end of my time here. And just even while we chat a little bit, I'll show one final picture as we come back to Andover, Massachusetts from the top of Mount Mansfield and, uh, and uh, think about uh, going back uh, to our, our daily lives, even if they're uh, a little bit odd this day, but uh, thinking about uh, what Andover uh, looked like. Uh, I think this is 1940, so we've got 80 years ago. And again, probably one of these shops was a watchmaker uh, who was uh, helping people keep their old clocks and watches going the same way that, uh, that I try to do today uh, uh, when I can help people with those old kickers. So I'm happy to have uh, come and talk to some of my townsfolk here. I love doing this all over the world, but uh, certainly in my own town is, uh, is, is a great way to do it too. So I can talk a minute about those, and then if you have a couple of questions, we can do it. And I can do it right from here so our camera guy uh, doesn't have any problems. This, uh, and I've looked at these already in advance. This is a nice Ansonia Crystal Palace clock. It would have had uh, a glass dome over it originally. But as you can imagine, glass domes are like the first thing to go when a clock uh, uh, has, a, has a problem. Um, but um, yeah, we were trying to simulate French clocks, as you heard me say. Uh, so this uh, you know, has these uh, spelter statues, uh, figurative things. This would have been an expensive clock when it was new. so. And there are people who collect these kinds of clocks. There are places still that make domes. They're very expensive. And you buy three because two will get broken before they get to you. Uh, but uh, 
but it's possible to get a dome over that again because the enemy of these, and the reason that I did repaired 18, well, I repaired 8,000 clocks so far, is because these are machines like your car, and they wore, wear out. The oil thickens, gets dirty, attracts dust, and that's why clocks stop. It has nothing to do with overwinding. You can't overwind a clock, but you definitely can not have a clock cleaned, and it stops. Same way, if you don't change the oil in your car, eventually the engine seizes up, and the machine no longer works. So whenever a clock has stopped, it's usually not anything has broken, it's just over the years, it has slowly worn itself, uh, and especially if it hasn't been oiled and cleaned, it just slowly chews itself up, and by the time it comes to me, it has stopped working. It's sort of a miracle that any of them still work, uh, but it's a testimony to the quality of the machine at the time. So that's our Ansonia Crystal Palace, named after uh, the, the, the company was founded by Anson Phelps, who was a big uh, manufacturer of brass and wanted other things to do. Started in Connecticut, eventually they built a big factory in Brooklyn, New York. The building's still there, it's condos now. Uh, we have a uh, German anniversary clock, 400 day clock, because they're called that because theoretically, you only have to wind them once a year. Uh, that's because when clocks like this tick, that pendulum goes back and forth pretty fast. And every time it ticks, it releases a little bit of the stored power of the mainspring. But an anniversary clock, instead of ticking 130 times a minute, those balls that go back and forth very slowly is essentially the ticking, and they only go back and forth eight times a minute. So you have that same stored up power in the spring, but it's only being released eight times a minute instead of 120 times a minute, so the clock can run so much longer based on that. Uh, they're not particularly accurate. Uh, they were made by the millions in Germany. Uh, and they came here. The very earliest ones that are from the 1800s are valuable and interesting, and, and people collect them. But you know, every fourth person that went to Germany you know, 50 years ago came home with an anniversary clock. Uh, so they're plentiful, and they don't have any real resale value. I repair them for people who, you know, who want them to work, and I'm thinking about you know, whether it's worthwhile to repair them. Uh, they just want them to run, and you know, they're interesting to watch those balls go back and forth. What I sometimes get is they hang from a very thin little flat wire called the torsion wire, and that allows the balls to rotate slowly. But sometimes Uncle Ernie thinks that that's how you're supposed to wind the clock. So they wind the thing up, and they get those balls spinning like mad, and they totally destroy that wire that's hanging down there. They turn it into a corkscrew. So when I see that, I know that uh, Uncle Ernie has decided he knows how to fix clocks, and uh, he's uh, made that uh, unfixable at, uh, at a higher cost. And our final uh, contestant here, I looked at a couple of watches too, thank you for bringing those. It's a, uh, and, uh, this is kind of a cousin of those black mantel clocks that I showed you that the woman had under her arm. These were early 20th century clocks made by the major makers like Seth Thomas and Waterbury and Ingram and Gilbert. Quite common, quite affordable. And still, it might have been three, four, five dollars to buy the clock, but that might be all that you made that week as a wage. So it was a significant purchase, but not out of reach, but it was special. And at the time this clock was made and sold and bought, it was probably the only clock that family had. You know, and it was valuable for that reason. It was, and then it's come down. It was grandma's clock was the only thing. They didn't have a clock in the microwave and one on the refrigerator and one on their phone and three in the drawer. You know, that was the clock for the house. So you know, I don't want to denigrate any of these, even though they were common and affordable. You know, at the time that clock was purchased new, it was an important part of the family. It was an appliance, as I say before, but it had life. People heard it tick, they heard it bong, they'd lie in bed at night and hear it ding ding, and they knew what time it was. So often when I restore these clocks for people, you know, they're, they're moved, they tear up, you know, oh, I haven't heard that since I slept over as a kid in my grandmother's house. So, uh, you know, all of those things are, uh, are interesting and important, and uh, I'm happy to see them all, and I appreciate that you brought them too. So I guess, I don't know how far we've gone over, but I'm, I'm still talking. If you have any questions, great. Otherwise, uh, uh, you can tell the world all you know about clocks now. How did you get involved with clocks? Uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> no, it's pretty simple, actually. I was, I was lucky, and it's one of those life-changing things that I wouldn't be standing there if I hadn't gone to a guy's house for Thanksgiving dessert uh, in 1980. 
you know, just one of these things where uh, I met this guy, you know, saw him again a year later, why don't you come over, oh, I can't, how about later, well, all right, I'll try, I almost didn't go because it was raining, went to his house, almost didn't see his basement, because, oh, they didn't want to see that junk, finally saw the basement and there was all this unbelievable clock and watch stuff, and whoa, what is this? And you know, the hook got me, you know, and uh, ever since Thanksgiving 1980, it's uh, every day in my life I've done something with it. It became a full-time profession, really, in the early 1990s, because uh, I did it as a hobby, which is how a lot of people start out. Mm -hmm. But you know, it was clear that there weren't many clock and watch makers around, and you know, it was a great career choice, because the second I you know, hung out my shingle, I was buried in work, and that's what happens with most repairs that immediately you, know, you have way more work than you can handle. You know? No guidance counselor in the high school is telling some kid that they should be a clock repairer, but they should be telling them that because it's been a wonderful profession for me. And now uh, I don't take any more new customers and I try not even to work very much at it because I'm writing a book about clocks and I do a lot of this lecturing. So, but I know the demand is still out there because every week I'd probably get five to ten calls for clock repair. And I have a colleague in Beverly, luckily, who wants to work. <laughs> so I, he hasn't told me to stop sending him people yet, but I think that's probably coming. Because everybody, oh yeah, call Ken Pearson, here's his number. So uh, <laughs> I, I hope he still wants to be as busy as I used to be. You know, I used to work 24-7, you know, I never, I never caught up. Uh, and so it was great. And it was, Wonderful. I mean, it's frustrating sometimes because, you know, essentially you're taking a, sometimes a two, three hundred year old machine that, you know, if, if the maker of that clock in 1780 thought that anybody in 2020 was going to be using that clock, he would have died laughing. You know, why would they? You know, what would be the point? So, you know, we think that these are eternal machines, somehow they're mystical and they run forever. They're just machines like anything else. And, Nobody's going to have a car or a vacuum cleaner 100 years from now. You know, they say, oh, I want to keep this. It was my grandmother's. Can you fix my dishwasher you know, from 2020 when it's 2120? But with clocks, it's a different story. People somehow think that they're going to work, and you know, they get irate. Oh, this thing's been working great for 50 years. Nobody's touched it. It just quit. You know, and they're mad at the clock, and they should be mad at themselves for not keeping it serviced. But you know, nobody knows that anymore. 100 years ago and more, you know, with Seth Shearman and all that, everybody knew that every couple of years you got your clock and watch clean. But, you know, nobody knows that anymore, and so those times go by. But it's frustrating because sometimes the clocks are so severely worn. Or again, if Uncle Ernie's going in there with his pliers and his can of WD-40, you know, they actually, you know, destroy the clock, and then it can't be fixed either. But luckily for me, most of the time, I can fix them. And then the people are happy, and the clocks go for more years. So it's, um, it's, it's mostly it's been good. People are happy to see me, you know, and the clock guys there. Oh, great! You know, it's not like their toilet is overflowing. You know, they got an emergency, and they're also sure they're going to be charged, you know, a million dollars because they're desperate. You know, with me, people are happy to see me, and I charge a reasonable amount. And here's Grandma's clock working again, or here's the clock we bought each other for our 25th anniversary. Thank God, there's still somebody to fix it. So it's been a great profession for that way too, because mostly you know, people are happy to see me and I'm happy to see them too, so it works well. That was a long answer, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's only the tip of the story, but uh, I, I think you got the gist of it. Anybody else, or are you ready to uh, go back to your daily lives now? Yeah. All right, did I do okay, Kelly? Was that, uh, that was incredible. Uh, thank, thank you so much.